And now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night. Welcome back to Matt's Movie Nights, where I recommend movies and we talk about them. Apologies if this one's a little awkward. Uh, my front-facing camera isn't working right now, so I can't actually see myself. I did double-check. I might not have that much headspace, but that's pretty normal, actually. I usually don't have that much headspace. I'm tall. Uh, so, last time we did some more uh, Universal monster movies. One of them was not Universal, actually. The second one we watched was an MGM picture, but uh, all in that same vein. Um, we started with the original Dracula from Todd Browning um, with Bela Lugosi. I actually, I watched another thing with him in it, and he refers to himself as Bela Lugosi, so I'm pretty sure that's how it's pronounced. So, uh, Dracula, of course, the classic tale of the original vampire, um, he comes, in, in this film, he comes to Britain? London? I think he goes to London, um, from Transylvania. He, he transports across the ocean from Transylvania to Britain and, you know, starts being Dracula, starts sucking people's blood. Uh, there's this one particular girl that he's, uh, he's going after. Uh, a lot of the movie takes place in, in an insane asylum because, uh, Dracula in, at, at the beginning of the film, uh, Renfield shows up at Dracula's castle and Dracula hypnotizes him into being his assistant. Um, I talk about Renfield in my, uh, Igor video. I'll pl plug it right here. I love that video. That's one of my favorite videos. That's probably the best video I've made. And I think I've said that before. I think the Igor video is the best video I've made. Yeah, so he hypnotizes Renfield into being his servant. And when Renfield shows up in Britain, he gets locked up in an asylum because he's acting all crazy because he's doing Dracula's bidding. <laughs> but then... Uh, and, and, you know, he's talking about vampires and shit. Actually, he's deliberately not talking about vampires and shit. Um, like, conspicuously, not like any time someone brings it up, he's like, Vampires? No, I've never, there's no vampires here, that's fake. No such thing as vampires. Um, but he's trying to eat, like, flies and spiders and rats because he's a vampire, but... He can't eat humans because he's, he's, you know, Dracula's servant. He's been hypnotized by Dracula. Dracula gets the humans. Renfield gets to eat rats. Um, and, and, like, the, the asylum manager's daughter, I think, is the person Dracula's going after. So it's also sort of an infiltration mission, right? Like... Renfield is actually doing crazy people stuff, but it's sort of an infiltration mission just to get close to, like, the girl Dracula once. And then, of course, you know, Dr. Van Helsing shows up, and he's he's talking about vampires. He's the one who brings up vampires, and, and Renfield gets super nervous about that, and he's like, Haha, I don't know what you're talking about. No vampires here. Nope. And that's, that's more or less the story of Dracula. It's very simple. It's very short, um, as most Universal monster movies are. Um, I like it, but, I, and I think I said this in the earlier videos, not my favorite Universal monster movie. Uh, not even my favorite adaptation of Dracula. I mean, I love Bela Lugosi. You know, he, he... He made the character iconic, right? When people think of Dracula, they always do the, the Bela Lugosi voice, you know? So so I've got a lot of respect for it, and, and to be fair, Bela Lugosi knocks it out of the park. This is 
his best performance ever. I've seen a lot of Bela Lugosi movies. Most of them aren't good. <laughs> uh, but this one, he knocks it out of the park. He he is Dracula. But it's it's not my favorite Dracula adaptation. And it's not my favorite Universal Monster movie. Because it's a little... Simple? I guess simple is the word I'm looking for. There's not a lot of Dracula in this movie, frankly. Like, Dracula isn't a big part of the story. You know, he shows up and everyone's kind of like, Ooh, oh no, it's Dracula. But none of them know he's a vampire. They're just like, God, what a prick. And... But then they're, they're like, Ooh, that Dracula character sure is suspicious. What if he's a vampire? And there's not really a lot of vampire shenanigans in the movie. He he drinks, like, one person's blood. Maybe two. I think two. He sucks their blood. I don't want to make it sound like I don't like this. I do enjoy this movie. I do like Dracula. But... I do think it's a little overhyped, is, is the only thing I would say about it. It's a little overhyped. And I think that's just because, like... It's the classic, it's the original, you know, and it, it was premiering at the same time as, like, Frankenstein, which Frankenstein, I think, stands up. I Frankenstein absolutely holds up. I, I have no problems with how much Frankenstein has been hyped up. I just, I don't think Dracula's as good. But it is, it is a good movie. It's a very good movie. Uh, it's, it's a very fun movie, lots of good performances, lots of good, like, aesthetics. It's, it's a really good looking movie for when it came out. Yeah, it's Dracula, I mean, what do you say about Dracula? <laughs> like, that's the thing. That's, I, I did this with Godzilla, too. Like, I was pointing out my problems with Godzilla because it's already been praised to death. Everyone knows Dracula's great. I don't have to tell you why Dracula's great. I have to tell you why I don't think it's as great as everyone else thinks it is. It's still a really good movie. I still really enjoy Dracula. For all of the reasons everyone else likes Dracula. You know? <laughs> like, like... The fact that I like Dracula a little bit less is my only unique take on Dracula. Everything everyone else loves this movie for, that's what I love it for. I love this movie for all the reasons everyone else loves this movie. I just maybe love it a little less than some other people. Uh, next up, we watched Mark of the Vampire, another movie where Bela Lugosi plays a vampire, kind of. But this was an MGM joint. Um, although it was, it was directed by Todd Browning who directed Dracula, um, and, and a lot of other classic horror monster movies. So, you know, like, clearly, clearly MGM were trying to cash in on Universal's Dracula with this movie. Um, even though it's a remake of an earlier Todd Browning film, um, actually, starring the star of the next movie we're going to talk about, Lon Chaney. Lon Chaney was in, I think, Bela Lugosi's role in the original. It was a silent movie called London After Midnight, and it's uh, one of the most famous lost movies of all time. Like, they, they, the poster has sold for, like, thousands of dollars, maybe even millions of dollars, because it's some of the few evidence we have that London After Midnight ever existed. So, we don't have London After Midnight anymore, but we do have Mark of the Vampire with Bela Lugosi in Lon Chaney's role. And, and clearly Mark of the Vampire was leaning a lot more into the vampire angle and the fact that Todd Browning had directed Dracula and that they had the same actor from Dracula. So... Like, you think, like, oh, it makes sense to remake this. First off, it was a silent movie, and a lot of silent movies got remade as sound movies in, like, the 30s and 40s. That was very common practice in early Hollywood. But also, like, you know, it's lost, so 
now we have a version of it, since the original was lost. Although I don't know if the original was lost when this came out, but I, I think more than likely it was just MGM going, what do we have that can compete with the Universal horror movies? Oh, look, Todd Browning made this movie for us. Let's call him up and get him to remake it and uh, see if he can get Bela Lugosi on this. All right, it's uh, uh, MGM's Dracula. It's not as good as Dracula. It's not anywhere near as good as Dracula. <laughs> Mark of the Vampire, the story of uh, a local, like, rich guy had died. And there were two marks on his neck, and every, all the townspeople are like, Oh my god, it was a vampire! It's one of those vampires that live up in that castle. Count, hmm, Count Mordu, something like that. Something like Count Mordu. Let me look it up. Okay, Count Mora. Count Mora is Bela Lugosi's name in this one. Uh, like, it's the, it's Count Mora. He's a vampire. He killed them. Um, and there's this, like, whole weird thing going on with the vampires. But by the end, none of it matters. Because it turns out the whole vampire thing was a setup by the local constable to get the real murderer to con to confess <laughs> right like like he led at least the murder and presumably most of the townspeople to think that vampires had done it just so he could get the actual murderer to confess and then it it turns out that like count mora and all of his vampire girls are just actors and it's it's the lamest fucking twist I'm like, okay, okay, not, not the lamest fucking twist. That's an exaggeration. It is not the lamest twist I've ever seen in a movie, but it is an extremely lame twist. Okay, better, better than April Fool's Day. April Fool's Day is some shit. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one goddamn guess how a slasher movie called April Fool's Day ends. Okay, you, you don't need you don't need me to tell you. You can figure it out just automatically. But but Mark of the Vampire, that's it's such a lame twist cuz like I was complaining about how little vampire shenanigans happened in Dracula. There's no vampire shenanigans in this cuz there's no vampires in this. There's there's some good shots. There's some good aesthetic stuff like the, the shots of Count Mora and his vampire girls, they're really good. They're really creepy. It's, it's good gothic atmosphere. But it's not an interesting movie. It's, it's a really dull movie, really. It's a, it's a slog, man. It's like there, there, there's a murder mystery going on, but there's not really a mystery because the movie spends the whole runtime being like vampires. It was vampires. Vampires did it. Surprise, vampires didn't do it. Okay, not a good mystery. Bad mystery. Um, wasn't super into this one. Again, there's stuff I liked about it. Bela Lugosi's good. The aesthetics are good, but. Man, it's just, it's, it's such a lame, it's not even just the ending. It's not that the ending ruins what would otherwise be a good movie. It's, the whole movie is just kind of lame. And it starts really strong, you know, like a guy's dead and it seems like a vampire did it. And you're like, ooh, vampires, where's this go? And tell me more. The, the rest of the movie is just, you know sort of waiting around for the ending where they can tell you, oh, it wasn't vampires. Boy, that was worth sitting through. Uh, it does feature, alongside Bela Lugosi, the original Barrymore, Lionel Barrymore. Uh, we saw his... Uh, grand-niece? Grand-nephew? He is Drew Barrymore's great-uncle. Um, we saw Drew Barrymore a couple weeks ago with Donnie Darko, so now we've got another Barrymore, Lionel Barrymore, who apparently invented the boom mic. That's wild to me. He's, he is an actor 
but he invented the boom mic. Um, I'm surprised no one had thought of that before. Just like, hey, what if we took a microphone and put it on the end of a really long stick and then had the stick just like right out of frame so we could pick up what the actors were saying? That just that just seems intuitive to me. Um, but Lionel Barrymore invented it. Good for him. This means we've seen more Barrymores than we have Carradines, which... How's that possible? We've seen so many John Carradine movies, not a single one of the other Carradines, but we've seen two Barrymores. We've seen Drew and Lionel now. We've seen none of the Sheens. That's weird, too. <laughs> I'm gonna have to recommend some Sheen Estevez movies. Who, who are some of the other famous, like, cult movie families? Uh, the, the Quaids? I would say, I think there's only two Quades. Maybe three. Two or three Quades. We haven't seen any of them, I think. No, I don't think we've seen any of them. So yeah, yeah there's the original Barrymore. Lionel Barrymore. Probably not the original. I think there were Barrymores appearing in, like, stage plays before this, but he was the first movie star. And then, you know, all of the other Barrymores were movie stars. Until Drew Barrymore's kids. And, you know, after the shit Drew Barrymore's been through, I kind of get why she doesn't want her kids getting involved with that. Fair enough. Fair play. <laughs> yeah, that's Mark of the Vampire. Not super impressed. Um, good, good shots. You know, like, if I were making a heavy metal music video or something and I wanted to use clips from old horror movies. There's good clips in here. There's there's good shots in here that would work in, like, one of those music videos that uses footage from old movies. But, uh... Not really a good story. Not really an interesting movie. Not, not worth sitting through just for the aesthetics. And then we watched, uh, the original 1925 Phantom of the Opera. Uh, our, our first silent movie, the first silent movie on Matt's Movie Nights, um, and probably the last for a while, <laughs> there's, there are silent movies I'd like to recommend, but not that many, um, and I've also tried to avoid recommending too many public domain movies. I think this is the first public domain movie I've recommended, actually. Um, there's a lot of public domain movies I like. But I'd kind of like to do something with them, since, you know, I am allowed to stream those movies. I'd like to, like, get in front of the camera and watch the movies along with you guys. So I try not to recommend too many public domain movies, and most silent films are public domain. So, uh, Phantom of the Opera. Everyone knows the story of Phantom of the Opera. That's the Phantom of the Opera, there's, uh, this guy who goes to the theater every night to see this one actress, and she stops appearing in plays, so he tells management, like, hey, you better start putting that woman back in plays, or bad things are gonna happen. And then they don't put her back in the play, and bad things do happen. And then the actress gets kidnapped by the guy who's making all these threats. And it's a guy who lives in the sewers under the opera house. And he, he wears a mask because his face got burned. I, I put trailers for all these movies between the movies just to sort of pad them out. So I have time to, like, get up, go to the bathroom, get a drink, get a snack between the movies. Um, and I put the trailer for this before the movie. And it's kind of funny in the trailer. They're like, ooh, no one's allowed to see what Lon Chaney looks like under the mask. When Lon Chaney as the Phantom is like an enduring icon of horror. Everyone knows what Lon Chaney as the Phantom looks like. So it's just one of those like classic spoilers that just everyone knows, you know? The Phantom, what the Phantom looks like, Darth Vader is Luke's father, uh, the, the murder in Psycho, just... 
pleasant movies that have been spoiled through cultural osmosis. Stars, stars um, Lon Chaney Sr., actually. I think it stars Lon Chaney Sr., which, if we're going for cult movie families, that's two Chaneys. So we got Lon Chaney Jr. and The Wolfman, and this is his father. So, two, two Chaneys as well. I think those are the only Chaneys, though. Um, it's interesting, for sure. Um, I, I'm glad to have watched it. Um, it, it is something I felt I needed to watch, and it is something I think, like, especially fans of horror should watch. I don't think it's actually that good of a movie just on its own. Um, I think, I think it's worth watching because it inspired a lot of other stuff that came after it. You watch it and you're like, oh, this is like this other later movie, and this is like that other movie, and, you know, everyone's referring back to Phantom of the Opera. It's one of, like, the classics of the horror genre. Um, it's mm, one of the earliest American horror films. I don't want to say the first one. Because I might get burned if I say that. But it's at least one of the first American horror movies. Because before before this you have like uh, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and, and Nosferatu. Um, which are both German movies. And frankly, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is better. Um, I might put this on par with Nosferatu. I don't know, though. It's been a while since I've seen Nosferatu. I need to rewatch Nosferatu. But it's not as good as the German Expressionist stuff that was coming out at the same time. But it's good. It's a start. It's a great place to start for American horror movies. Like, if you want to talk big American horror movies, this was the first big American horror movie. So yeah, very classic, very iconic... Um, lots of great stuff going on in this movie. Lots of great aesthetic stuff in this movie. I still feel like Phantom of the Opera is a story that needs sound to work. That's, I think, the film's biggest problem. Is, is that it's a silent movie. Um, I, because I've seen other adaptations of Phantom of the Opera. I saw the musical on Broadway. The musical's really fucking good. I really like the musical. Um, the play, not the movie. I will not defend the movie. This is better than the movie based on the play. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a story that works much better in sound with, like, music. <laughs> That's that's why I think it adapted so well into a musical. Like, it's already a story about music. Make it a musical. Perfect. Also, a, a lot of later adaptations, and maybe this was in the book and they just cut it for the movie, but to my knowledge, most adaptations have the Phantom writing something specifically for the girl he likes. So she's supposed to sing the things he has written, and that, I don't think, happens in this movie. Um, unless I just, like, blinked and missed it. <laughs> They're playing Faust. Is That's the play that's performing in this film, Faust. And there's this really good line in there about, like, ooh, you'll be playing Faust in a cursed theater. It's like, hmm, good, good one. Not as good as the German movie Faust. I, I like that one better. That's another silent movie that's better than this one, Faust. I don't know, I like, Fant I, I like this Phantom of the Opera well enough, but I, I think it stands more as, like, like a monument. It's, it's, you know, an important piece of film history, but it inspired a lot of better stuff. It's, it's not some perfect, untouchable movie. It's a little slow... It's a little dry. It needs sound. It, it really, it needs, you know, music. You gotta hear this stuff. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still well worth watching, I think. It's still well worth watching at least once just to, like, you know, know your history. This is, this is a movie that is inspired 
so many other movies. It's it's important to see just for that. And I don't want to make it sound like the bad movie. It's not bad. It's not boring. It's just there's better stuff. Um, there's better Phantom adaptations. Multiple better Phantom adaptations. I almost made the question for last week, what's your favorite adaptation of Phantom of the Opera? But that's a question that has a correct answer. If you say anything but Phantom of the Paradise, I'm sorry, we can't be friends. It's Phantom of the Paradise. Phantom of the Paradise is the correct answer to that question. Why haven't I shown Phantom of the Paradise? Uh, put a pit in that one. We're definitely gonna watch Phantom of the Paradise. That's that's definitely coming. Uh, I fucking love Phantom of the Paradise. <laughs> one of my favorite movies. One of my favorite... It's, it's not my favorite Brian De Palma movie, but it might be my second favorite Brian De Palma movie. Top three, at least. Um, the question I did ask last week is, what's a movie you feel like you should have seen... And haven't yet. As far as movies, I feel like I should have seen by now, and I just haven't. I said last week Phantom of the Opera was one of them, but now I have seen it. So probably the movie I haven't seen that I feel like I should see the most is Lawrence of Arabia. I've never seen Lawrence of Arabia. Like, that and Ben-Hur are both of these, like, old school like Hollywood epics that are like three fucking hours <laughs> and I'm like oh man I might like Lawrence of Arabia I'm on the I, I, I'm not saying I'm not gonna like Lawrence of Arabia I almost guarantee I'm not gonna like Ben-Hur because I've heard of the things people compare Ben-Hur to and none of them are things I like <laughs> I'm just, I'm not a big fan of Dino De Laurentiis' epics, you know? Later in his career, when he started chilling out and just producing stuff, you know, I've got a poster for Flash Gordon right on my wall, right there, and, like, top line, it says, Dino De Laurentiis presents Flash Gordon. I love Flash Gordon, but his biblical epics, <sighs> they're such a chore. They're sh such a chore. Which is probably why I haven't seen Lawrence of Arabia or Ben Hur. I'm just like. <laughs> I should, but I know it's gonna be a pain in the ass. Even if I like Lawrence of Arabia, even if I like Ben Hur, it's gonna be a pain in the ass. So we're we're saving those for a rainy day, you know? A day where I just have absolutely fucking nothing to do. And it's like, alright, let's finally watch Lawrence of Arabia. I, I think those are probably the two biggest movies I have not seen yet. Um, be, I'm pretty good about, like, oh, this is popular in the cultural zeitgeist. Let's watch it, right? Like, last year, I watched Grease and West Side Story. Because I hadn't seen either of those before, like, late last year. So I, I, I tend to be pretty good about, oh, people always talk about this movie. Let's actually watch it. Then again, I don't know that I've ever spoken to anyone who has seen Lawrence of Arabia or Ben-Hur. <laughs> those are just like, they're, they're like the TMC classics. They're, they're like... Ooh, this is, these are the big, important old movies you have to watch. But nobody watches them anymore. <laughs> uh, God, I've been talking too long about this. Let's move on. Uh, what's your favorite adaptation of Dracula? There you go. Who's your favorite Dracula? Because tonight, we're gonna watch my favorite Dracula, Christopher Lee in Horrors of Dracula. That's right, I love Bela Lugosi, great actor, great performance, made the character iconic, Christopher Lee is better. And then, we're actually gonna go in order with the Dracula franchise, at least for now. Some of the later movies we're gonna skip because they're not worth watching. But, at least for now, we're gonna watch the second Dracula movie, Brides of Dracula. Brides, plural? Yes, Brides of Dracula. 
And then uh, we're going to end it with the Frankenstein movie I skipped. Whoops. Frankenstein's Revenge. Those are the recommendations for tonight. Uh, Watch those, and we'll talk about them next time. Until then, have a nice day.